welcome back. I hope you've gotten a sense of what the course is about. What we're going to do now before delving into the science of happiness is think about how have the great thinkers thought about happiness and meaningful life over history. This is really one of the oldest questions that humans have been grappling with. What is happiness? How do I lead a meaningful life? How do I cultivate the happiness of people around me? Scientists have gotten into this game really late and there have been great thinkers for quite some time who have been grappled with this fundamental question of what is happiness. I'm going to give you a quick survey of some of the great thinkers. I'm sure you have a sort of um, your own thinking as we move forward through this course um, about those thinkers. Let's take a quick spin through this great thinking of happiness. The first stop is the great Chinese philosopher Confucius, about 2,500 years ago, who started thinking and writing about what it means to be happy, to lead a virtuous life, and to be content. And from his and let's uh, from about 2,500 years ago, writes about the concept of uh, Jen, J-E-N. Jen is really about dignity. And it conveys a sense of reverence and a humanity towards others. What's that really uh, um, is telling us, and in a way you will see that in the course, is the deep and lasting theme that the happiness is a sense um, that is uh, that has more of an outward orientation in enhancing the welfare of others. Well, let's turn uh, to great traditions and. Uh, Eastern thought that has influenced a lot of uh, uh, substance and science of uh, this class, which is from Buddhism. Again, a kind of line of thinking that traces back 2,500 years. I really love this quote. One of the leaders of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, His Highness the Dalai Lama, writes, If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Again, it's interesting how he emphasizes orienting your attention to other people uh, and that compassion, as we learn in module three, is one of these very powerful pathways to happiness. And this thinking of the Dalai Lama is part of the broader tradition of Buddhism that many of you probably have heard um, the talk about the state of peacefulness and contentment and happiness uh, called nirvana. So the pathway to the state of happiness or nirvana really starts from the recognition, which is the first noble truth, that there are a lot of difficulties in life, there are a lot of sufferings. And then second noble truth that we find nirvana and happiness and peacefulness when we detest from like um, clinging tendencies and grasping. And then there are all these practical recommendations in Buddhist uh, philosophy that gets us to that state of detachment or nirvana. Things like practicing equanimity and calmness or things like kind speech, uh, which also in some ways would be talking about those uh, compassion and kindness and welfare towards others, the outward orienta orientation in module three. Yet again, uh, the great tradition in Eastern thought emerged 2,500 years ago. Um, little lesser recognized today of te uh, Taoism. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there's a, a quote that says, When man is born, he's tender and weak. At death, he's stiff and hard. All things, as well as the grass and the trees, tender and subtle while alive. When dead, withered and dried. Therefore, the tender and weak are the companions of life, and the stiff and the hard are companions of death. It's a little paradoxical, right? Weakness and tenderness being portrayed as the pathway to life. And again, like challenging us to put aside our preconceptions, uh, conceptions of um, way to find happiness. Well, let's now shift uh, to another continent, if you will, uh, to move to more gr uh, Greek philosophy of uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle, um, almost like 2,500 years ago, talking about one of my favorites is 
uh, Aristotle talking about meaningful life and happiness. Um, the Greeks were really interested in how happiness is uh, found at the end of life when you're summing up things that uh, you've um, given to the world and kind of balance of virtuous acts that you have engaged in while you were alive. So thinking about happiness in this virtuous life, Aristotle arrives at a very useful idea called as the principle of moderation. So Aristotle writes when articulating the principle of moderation uh, that anyone can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry at the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose and the right way, that's not within everybody's power and it's not easy. And that is really the appropriate fashion that when the, uh, when our passions are cultivated in the right context, they bring us happiness and good life. And even passions like anger, when for example engaged in social injustice, can bring about a lot of good and happiness. So Aristotle is suggesting moderation and acceptance of our passions as a pathway for happiness. Well, if you have to move more forward uh, in time historically and talk about a couple of ideas on this broader perspective of what happiness is. Coming out of European uh, philosophy might not surprise you, parts of France or elsewhere was the hedonistic uh, viewpoint of happiness. Really, it's, it's that notion that happiness is really about pleasure and sensation, that it's a way that we really define happiness as a sum of all the uh, sensory pleasures in the absence of pain. Uh, if I wanted to know if I'm happy or not from this hedonistic perspective, I would sort of take stock of my uh, delicious meals, if I had a wonderful coffee or burrito, um, have I enjoyed the beauty of like walking in the woods with the sensation of uh, you know, sun on my skin. And that, if I felt it, right, that's when I would think, oh, I'm happy today. It's really based on the sensations of uh, senses I've experienced. Well, building off of that perspective, I think is really important and powerful idea of uh, ut utilitarianism. Um, utilitarianism. Right, I got it. Utilitarianism. Uh, so it is a notion that happiness is actually um, found in actions and it brings the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Well, let's think about it. Happiness is found in actions that lift up the welfare in as many people as possible. So if I have to tell that again, it's the notion that happiness is found in your actions that bring about the greatest happiness for the happiness, for the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. So that's something very similar to uh, you know, the Eastern philosophy, you will see there is a distinction now um, that researchers increasingly find about it, finding about the Western and the Eastern of how it's more relational, more focused on the collectivism uh, aspect of it that, uh, well, you know, happiness is more defined as uh, directed towards others versus self. Um, so we, we will talk about it in a minute. Well, uh, of course, like there are great traditions in thinking about happiness. The other could be um, Judeo-Christian ways of thinking about happiness, Hinduistic approach uh, that emerged from India actually of how happiness is really found in the freedom of desire uh, and Buddhist from like non-clinging, non-attached attachment uh, type of thinking and uh, practice of yoga, for example, like for breathing posture uh, as a way of cultivating happiness. Um, really, the core of all this is a philosophy that peace and happiness are found when we are no longer desiring the wrong thing. Well, scientists are looking at cultural vari variations and in that recent studies, researchers have found that the Western mindset of things um, with regards to happiness is about freedom and achievement, kind of like self-gratification. And uh, Eastern mindset is about like the perspective of relational connection, community as a duty. So it's important to bear in mind when we are trying to attempt uh, defining happiness of 
uh, the different perspectives in question. And it is our task now to study the scientific perspective and also about our own personal perspective of